Cheers. Welcome to Culture Night. Where each week we drink fancy wine and watch movies that are in some way culturally significant. I'm Andrew. And I'm Sarah. And we are here for episode 15. Oh, we should have drank a five. Mm, oh, spoiler right. alert for the wine. We didn't drink a five. Oh, oh well. well. Um, I think it's good that we're clearing out some of our old stash. Spoiler yeah. alert. Um, but let's uh, hop into some podcast business first. Yes. To start things off, this is our season finale for season one of Culture Night Pod. Mm-hmm. Made it through a full season. Yeah. We... Um, uh, we went into this with very little planning and just kind of got things started, but we felt like 15 episodes was a good place to kind of stop and take a week mm-hmm. off. Spoiler alert, we will not be watching a movie next week um, and just kind of regroup and figure out what we wanted to do. We've watched so many great movies to start off with and um, we've learned a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you said, we, I don't think we had really any planning for this um, and we Didn't really, I think we knew we eventually wanted to have seasons of this, but we Mm -hmm. were just trying to find our our voice, trying to find out what we liked and didn't like. And so we were just hopping around all throughout, you know, decades and genres and all sorts of things. And now I think going forward, we'd like to have kind of a common theme for at least a couple movies in a row. Mm -hmm. Um, Having shorter seasons with a more focused theme each. It'll be unlikely that we'll have like a 15 episode season. Most of these are going to be much shorter, like you know, a couple episodes to um, whether we're exploring a genre or a decade or an actor or, Mm -hmm. or some kind of fun puzzle like Mm -hmm. this past week. Yeah. Um, Just that way we're more focused. It'll also make it easier for us to pick movies because that's been the hardest part with literally being able to choose from any movie in the Mm -hmm. history of time. It's been really hard for us to pick a movie every week that by doing something more focused, we'll be able to narrow our list down and pick things a little bit easier and give some more continuity for the audience. And, Mm -hmm. um, be a bit more predictable at least yeah and i think we'll also take a lot more from the movies if we're watching a bunch of similar Mm -hmm. genres whatever decade in a row um but we will like i said we will be taking a one week break from movies next week and we are going to come out with a shorter bonus episode that's just more of like a q and a q and a Mm-hmm. behind the scenes of the we're explaining of you know where this came from and what we're, yeah. what we're doing <laughs> the origin story um just a little bit more about us and mm-hmm. a little bit of a recap of season one so we can kind of reflect on what we've learned so we are excited to wrap up this season with one last movie but before one last movie what are we drinking this week we are drinking the 2014 tobin james james gang reserve primitivo and like we kind of already mentioned, we um, we have a log of all of the wines that we have in our cellar, and we're just kind of trying to go through and drink the older ones so that we can enjoy them before they really do turn and go bad. So mm-hmm. this one is nine years old. It's got a little bit of like spice in the nose. A little bit. Nothing remarkable, though. It's mm-hmm. just kind of smells like wine. Yeah. I get spice. Yeah, a lot of spice. Feels almost like Christmassy. Just mm-hmm. um, per- tastes fairly thick. I feel like this would pair well with those crockpot meatballs. Mm-hmm. The grape jelly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're not wrong. I just did not think you were going right there. Yeah. Um, you all know what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> the American crockpot meatballs mm-hmm. with grape jelly. Mm. Yeah, spice. I don't really know how to describe the sweetness, but it almost feels like a more it's like a little a, sweet. It's a not. It's more like an artificial sweet. Yeah, it might just be that we didn't age it very well, and mm-hmm. it's getting a little more like syrupy sweetness there. But it almost feels like it's closer uh, to a dessert wine. Yeah. I, don't think, I don't think it's it's, it's not a dessert wine. It's not that kind. I don't of think sweet. it was originally meant to be, but the way it's kind of been aged, I guess. Yeah. Or, it's closer, but I mean, it's been a long time since I've had a true dessert wine. But those mm-hmm. suckers are sweet, and this isn't that sweet. But it it does have that mm-hmm. same feeling yeah. to it for sure. But it's good. And now it's time to go behind the screens where each week we go behind the big screens of Hollywood and learn more about some aspect of film production or storytelling. So I will turn it over to you tonight. So this week we are exploring the role of assistant director on a film set. Um, So I think most people are kind of familiar with what a director is, or at least what a director is portrayed to be in like movies and everything like that. But an assistant director um, is more of a logistical role. So they are in charge of tracking the daily progress against the uh, filming schedule, uh, preparing the daily call sheets to see, you know, make sure everyone's uh, where they need to be. Just overall making sure that the cast and crew is, is doing what they need to do and being where they need to be and also taking care of the health and safety of the crew. I feel like that's a job I would like. Very mm-hmm. organizational, 
kind of trying to keep track of everything and mm -hmm. getting all the ducks in a row. Yeah. Funny enough, there's um, also a role of assistant to the director, which is different from assistant director, it, although sometimes they get confused, uh, but their responsibilities are entirely different. Um, so we can maybe cover that in a, in a later episode of what the assistant to the director is, but I assume that they're mainly just kind of like getting them coffee versus that's, actually. That's what getting I would take from it. Set. And it's not surprising that they have similar names because it feels like there's a thousand roles in the mm -hmm. credits that are similar, but probably do completely different things. So mm -hmm. we definitely have to add that to our list. So like I said, one of the uh, big responsibilities is calling the role, um, which is, you know, make sure that everyone's where they need to be and that um, if they're waiting on someone, there's like actual like key phrases they're supposed to use that are, or that have become standard across the filmmaking um, industry, uh, such as waiting on, you know, telling them like, like waiting on lighting, lighting or waiting on talent to call that out so that people know to, you know, get to where they need to be. Um, final checks, uh, calling for quiet on the set, um, and also telling the um, sound and camera crews when to start rolling. It is generally the um, director or assistant director that calls action. So sometimes some directors prefer to call action. Other times it's the actual assistant director. Um, Interesting. But the director is usually the one that says cut. Uh, and after the director the director has called cut, the assistant director will check to make sure that they're happy with the director's happy with the take and make sure everything's everything is um, is good there. And originally, the role of assistant director was kind of like a, a stepping stone to becoming a director. So first, you'd become an assistant director, train under a director, and then become that. that makes sense. But because it's become mostly a very you know managerial log logistical position uh, and not necessarily a very creative one. Uh, that transition isn't um, very common anymore. Um, Alfred Hitchcock was an assistant director uh, before becoming a director, but more often now, a assistant director might uh, move to like become a theater production manager or a producer role, uh, but not a producer would have been my guess becoming a director. Interesting. So that is the role of the assistant director, and obviously under assistant director, there's tons of second, third assistant directors and all that so um kind of cascades down there the roles responsibilities but interesting that's at least one of the other directors that we see uh, mentioned there on i know the i feel credits. like i almost feel like we need to sit down during the credits and write down all the roles that we don't know and then mm -hmm. that way we have a springboard of a list to go through because there's there's a lot of stuff on these sets that i don't know much about and i feel like the list is just constantly growing because mm -hmm. every time all every time there's like a new year it's like each movie gets a hundred new roles mm -hmm. especially with like the evolution of technology and, and stuff, stuff. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we will move into our slept on it segment where we are going to go back and revisit Forrest Gump from last week. Um, does your rating change after sleeping on it? You rated it a 10 and I rated it an 8.2. I so badly want to give it like a 9.8 or 9.7 or something, but I just, I'm kind of still can't find anything to, to dock it for. In fact, it, like, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, yep, it covers just every single base of everything that we, we generally like discuss in these movies. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess I got to keep it at a 10. Yeah. I mean, you definitely talked me up and you're still talking me up the more we talk <laughs> about it. Um, and I think because I already have feel so uncultured in the frame of movies, it feels too aggressive for me to give it a 10 because I feel like I don't have as much to base it on. Mm -hmm. And I already feel like just in the last 15 episodes, oh, I should change this or I should change this just having more in my repertoire to base things off of but like you said it it, it really checks all the boxes yeah. i will move it up to a 9.4 i it, giving it a perfect score just i just feel like i can't do that in season one it feels so wrong but i'm i i just i can't mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> if you could tell me if you could tell me one thing that i should be like no you shouldn't because then i would be like yep sure a, a 9.7 sounds right because it feels like a 9.7 but yeah I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Yeah. And maybe, you know, in season 10 of Culture Night mm -hmm. Pod, when we're still going strong with this, yeah. I'll look back and be like, oh, this was definitely a 10. But mm -hmm. right now, I, I feel like I can't fully commit to that without having seen a lot more movies. There's no rules here. I may give something an 11 someday. We'll, we'll see. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Can't keep up with you. Cool. So, yeah. And I'm, I will, I'll get into a little bit more of my why my rating changed and some of those mm -hmm. things in my deep dives as well. Cool. Let's go into the deep dives then. Yeah, um, you kick us off. So, yeah, I, I will go first. Um, I mentioned that, uh, I guess, last week that there was a potential sequel to, to Forrest Gump. And there was indeed a sequel book that was written uh, in 1995. Uh -huh. uh, so it came out, a, the book came out a year after the movie. Okay. 
And Forrest Gump was based on a book. Yes, if yes, if Forrest Gump. nobody knew that, we learned that this yes, week. Yes, it obviously they cut some things out and changed some things, but they tried to uh, allegedly try to stay um, close to the the book as much as best as possible while still telling a good story. But having not read it, I can't say how much they they stuck to it. Mm-hmm. But it this, the sequel book it, at least is wild. <laughs> um, so in it, um, Jenny dies. And this one, it comes back as a ghost. Okay, let's not prepare for uh, that. <laughs> yep. Um, he tries to, uh, I guess, kidnap uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, causes the Ex- Exxon Valdez spill, um, uh, starts dating a, a German girl in Soviet Germany, and he creates new Coke. Um, he tries Coke out- like Coca Cola or cocaine? New, new Coke, new Coca-Cola. Okay, I mean, yeah. we're coming off of Scarface, I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, he tries out for the uh, New Orleans Saints. Um, he's a janitor in a strip club. Um, he sells off his, or Lieutenant Dan sells off his share of bubble gum shrimp and the company goes under. Um, just a, a whole lot that, that kind of goes on. Well, now um, I kind of feel like I need Forrest to read this starts, book. Young Forrest starts drinking as an adolescent. At, like, for, Not like, sweet like, baby Forrest. Yeah, Forrest Gump Jr. So, um kind of crazy uh it seems like the uh the movie though never really had a shot because the script for the sequel uh was submitted to the studio on september 10th 2001 so uh obviously things got a little busy um right after that yeah, yeah. and it got kind of buried and went into development hell and in 2007 they took another look at it but i think everyone kind of realized this is stupid and we've kind of lost the momentum of coming out right after forrest gump and tom hanks mm-hmm. is getting older and just wouldn't have really happened um tom hanks said this year though that they never seriously considered it ever and it was just kind of like a yeah i know people want to make more money but there's just no real reason to make it yeah i mean i feel like they could do it really well if like with if they mm-hmm. had the same enthusiasm that they went into the first movie with if and mm-hmm. so many more historical events have happened since then that they could do it but i kind of agree that it's best just left as is the author i guess passed away in 2020 so i th- I, I don't know what the um, ip belongs to at this point mm-hmm. but I, I feel like they've kind of lost that they could obviously digitally de-age tom hanks or make up some storyline there and, and write something entirely novel after mm-hmm. that with like better storytelling but I just feel like don't mess with something that's so great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, although they did a good job with the Top Gun sequel, so who's it's to true. say, but I would say just, just leave it that. as is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the stuff I looked into, um, well, first of all, we watched the movies that made us on Netflix and another YouTube behind the scenes of Forrest Gump. So we watched those together to get a lot of, so not, there was nothing about this sequel in there, but a lot of the information we got from these shallow dives were on those um, resources. But to start off with, we kind of mentioned that Tom Hanks running was really weird and we wanted to know what kind of like physical training and stuff that he did. And I watched one video that said he did do a little bit of running, but he had a double for a lot mm. of his running. And it turns out that part of his, or at least one of his doubles, I don't know if he had multiple, was his own brother. So mm. someone that looked similar enough to him without actually being yeah, I know his brother also does like the voice acting for woody for various things of like video games or sm- like the smaller stuff smaller interesting stuff, yeah. that's really cool um and also fun fact tom hanks and the director bob zemeckis funded the whole running scene because the studio wanted to cut it for costs mm-hmm. so they forked out their own money and paid for all those shots all around america which mm-hmm. uh, as a runner it, I, I really enjoyed those scenes yeah and the movie just wouldn't be the same without mm-hmm. them that's for sure and then we also wanted to look more into Forrest Gump's accent. And whilst doing that, I also kind of found out more about how they found the character character of Forrest and really developed that role. Um, and they really put a lot of time and effort and really thought through a lot of the small details to kind of figure out who this character was. Um, to start with the accent, the director, Bob Zemeckis, was talking to Tom Hanks and told him that he needed to talk to the actor who played Young Forrest, who was um, Michael Connor Humphreys, and get him to start talking like Tom Hanks is the character of Forrest. And Tom Hanks was like, you know, he's a kid, maybe... I should start talking like him because he was apparently from like deep Mississippi. So he already had that Southern accent. And um, the thing that really stood out for Tom Hanks was that um, Michael had a really hard G sound. So instead of thinking, it would be like thinking. And Mm -hmm. so that 
kind of helps lead into him finding his voice. And apparently somewhere Tom Hanks has hours of cassette tapes of him and Michael Connor Humphreys just talking, just having like mm-hmm. conversations offset so that he can hear this kid's voice and use him as the inspiration for mm-hmm. Forrest Saxon, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and then Tom Hanks has also said that the clothing for Forrest Gump is what inspired part of like who Forrest is. It started with the, he's all dressed up on the, park bench to go see Jenny Mm -hmm. in that first scene. And he's like, well, why would Forrest be so dressed up? Like what in his mind is triggering him to wear this nice of an outfit? And like those kinds of thoughts is what guided his whole performance of the character is, well, why would he do this? Or why would he do things this way? Um, And he's also been quoted. This is a quote from Tom Hanks from the article I was reading that said, um, and out of that being the clothing came this big logic um, about what defined all of these things, how he talks, how he runs, and how he reacts to his fantastic life really had to come out of this idea that he only operates at the speed of his own common sense. And that common sense is, um, has been dictated by his mama primarily. He got his common sense from his mama. So what was that? How does that translate? So going back to like, maybe some, his mom said something, but he took it this way. And just Mm -hmm. so much of that is what guided how he made choices for Forrest, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. I'm so glad they transitioned from him being like viewed as like a um, savant mm-hmm. to more being, he was just very, you know, simple mm-hmm. and just took you know. things at face value mm-hmm. instead of um, like uh, the article also said, you know, instead of being like, we were like two peas in a pod. He knows that his mom always served peas and carrots. So mm-hmm. it was, we went together like peas and carrots. So it was just those little things mm-hmm. of how, you know, he took things where like, Oh, this is what I know. And this is how I'm going to mm-hmm. talk about this stuff. Yeah. So, Very interesting. We also talked about his ping pong skills and how much he had to learn ping pong. And did he use any of that afterwards? Mm -hmm. But it turns out he was already a pretty great ping pong player. But so much of it was done with CGI that I don't know how much of it was really Mm -hmm. put to use. Um, But yeah, he he was definitely like already good at ping pong. But they they um, the fact that he was doing everything so exact and being such a you know world's best ping pong player, they obviously did the CGI for all of the ball. Mm -hmm. But and for that, they had a they had a metronome. So that the, him and the um, person he was playing against, who was also a professional ping pong player, mm-hmm. had knew what beat to be stroking the ball with. Mm-hmm. And then they slowly picked that speed up so that they had something to follow. So it wasn't just these random movements. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it also helped him be more natural with the movement at having been a ping pong player as oh, opposed sure. to just being like, hey, you've never played this before, but go ahead and just look like you're the best at it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had one more. I We talked about the Apple um, stock because he mentions that they'd invested in a fruit company. Apple and didn't have to worry about money anymore. But I was wondering how valuable was Apple at that time? I know now it's like the most valuable company in the world, but at that time, how valuable would it have been? And um, looking at the stock price, so when they went public in, I guess, 1980, um, they went public around eight cents and that peaked at about 52 cents in 1991 before um, dropping down to about 25 cents in 1994. Um, so it wouldn't have been that large of a increase if they had um, invested then say like maybe a three to four times return on mm-hmm. the investment, which obviously is not nothing, but it's not like unless you invested everything you have into it, it's not like it's, you know, just going to be completely able to retire off it. However, um, another site did some investigation and said that if they had um, invested or Apple was taking investments before they went public and if they'd invested a hypothetical $100,000 at a 3% stake in Apple before they went public, um, then it would be worth today, I guess in 2022, $66.63 billion. Uh, wow. So obviously it wouldn't have been nearly that much back in 1984. It would have still been a very sizable amount because mm-hmm. um, being able to invest before the company went public obviously is a huge advantage there. So um, assuming he kept all of that uh, and it didn't... Uh, you know, sell everything off or anything like they implied in, in the uh, sequel book. Uh, yeah. He would have not had to worry about money anymore. Yeah. Yikes. And it wasn't until you really even mentioned it when we were talking about it afterwards last week that I really thought about, you know, 1994 Apple is so different from 2023 mm-hmm. Apple. And just, I didn't really process it. All. I was like, Oh, haha, Apple, like he got in. That's such a cool, like cultural reference. This but like, the iP- but iPod, whoa. For, for the iPhone, obviously. How much it's blown up since then. AirPods, mm-hmm. all the things. Okay, so I will wrap it up with one last quote from the article. Um, It was from thethings.com. 
I've not heard of it before, but mm-hmm. it was a whole article about Forrest Gump and it was written by Hannah Wigand. And she said, um, everyone knows the life is like a box of chocolates line or run Forrest run. That's what makes a film a classic when lines like that are just cemented in society's brain. Even if some have never actually watched the film, they become part of the collective unconscious almost. And I feel like that's so much summarizes of what we are looking for in movies mm-hmm. is that quotability that, I mean, until almost high school, probably I hadn't seen this movie Mm -hmm. But I knew that quote for sure that there's a lot of the movies that are on our lists have those quotes Mm -hmm. that's like, well, you know those. So that's why they're part of the pop culture. Even as a kid, I remember hearing run Forrest run before even knowing what Forrest Gump was. So many Mm -hmm. of those things were just like, you see someone running, that's what you yell. Or Mm -hmm. hearing the phrase life is like a box of chocolates. I doubt that was that common before then. Mm -hmm. But because that's what Tom Hanks said, Mm -hmm. it became part of the, you know, the societal fabric Mm -hmm. so i just as i was reading that i was like yes i feel like that's really what we're looking for to have a really great movie on our scale is to have that like Mm -hmm. cemented in society's brain type type of movie so anyways with that that's forrest gump and now it's time to hop into this week with our grand puzzle reveal Mm -hmm. so we watched in order aaron brockovich scarface Scarface, forrest Forrest Gump. gump and tonight we are watching Pirates of the Caribbean, The Black Curse of the Black Pearl. So those are our four movies. Mm-hmm. And um, do we reveal the, the actual source of the puzzle now? <laughs> All of these movies come from a song <laughs> that that we embarrassingly mm-hmm. really love. <laughs> and it's uh, Jack Sparrow by The Lonely yeah. Island from SNL. Mm-hmm. And just a short backstory, because we are running a little long on this mm-hmm. opening segment, but we deep in the pandemic by deep i mean like april april may May of 2020 yeah and we had for reference what like a three-month-old baby Mm -hmm. so we were like tired new parents in the middle of a global pandemic not going anywhere a little bit crazy we blasted that song but i don't even know why we started listening to the song but one day we listened to the song and then we were like Mm -hmm. man this is really catchy this is the tale and for weeks I mean, mm-hmm. we would both, we'd like pass each other in the house and we would start singing it at each other. We would play mm-hmm. it every night during bath time for our daughter. Like we got really deep into this song for a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> True pandemic so if craze. if you're not familiar with the song, please go listen to Captain Jack Sparrow by The Lonely Island. It's very catchy. And if you have watched along with us the last couple of weeks, you will see a lot of familiar things and appreciate why mm-hmm. we chose the movies that we did. <laughs> so... Moving on, the rating of the movie is PG-13. I believe this was the first PG-13 Disney movie. I was going to say something about that, but I wasn't certain. But I, I do, a big there deal. was drama yeah. around it. That, that will be a deep dive for next week. <laughs> Start um, that off now. But uh, now, let's hop into our time machine and head back to 2003. Uh, the top three movies released that year were Finding Nemo, that grossed $339 million. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, that grossed $305 million, followed by Lord of the Rings, I guess this would have been The Return of the King, uh, grossing $290 million. The top three songs released that year were In the Club by 50 Cent, Ignition, I'm assuming it's the remix to Ignition, I don't think Ignition <laughs> I original don't think ever OG or Ignition. So Ignition popular. Remix uh, by R. Kelly and Get Busy by Sean Paul. Now, these truly spark memories in mm-hmm. me. We were old enough to appreciate all of these things. The songs, the movies. Mm-hmm. I, have, I have not seen Lord of the Rings, but the movie, yes, like, definitely a throwback. Mm-hmm. Our prime, awkward middle school years. Um, <laughs> have you seen it before? Yes, I have. I have as well. Um, when it came out, I saw it in theaters, and uh, I've always loved it. I remember my cousins going to see it at the beach, and they asked me if I wanted to go. And I was really on the fence about it because all my cousins are older than me. Mm-hmm. So anyways, um, what do you know about the movie? Um, it's about Jack Sparrow. He's a pirate. Mm-hmm. Goes on a pirate-like adventure. It follows the... It's based on the Disney ride. Mm-hmm. Lucy, I feel like they they changed they, the ride to match the movie afterwards. Yeah. But a lot of... I mean, it was not like the movie came out and then they made the ride. In this mm-hmm. case, the ride came before the movie. Yeah, I know they did. Like, they shut it down for a while to... to um, change it up mm-hmm. um, but yeah this was obviously a long time Disney uh, ride before it ever became a movie and they had to write the, the backstory for it but um, I'm excited to, to revisit it and uh, check it yeah. out especially go back to that like you said the middle awkward middle school years mm-hmm. yeah so Pirates of the Caribbean let's go
Cheers. Cheers. Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. I was going to say Curse of the Black Pearl. <laughs> Should we, do we need yeah. to start over? Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Pirates of the Caribbean. The Curse of the Black Pearl. <laughs> That's better than I thought it was going to be. Okay, worth it. <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to, despite our exciting intro, we're going to jump yeah. into the wine first. Yeah. Wine first. Um, I'll go first with my reading this week for the wine. I give it a 5.5. Okay, I had it at a 6.4. Yeah. I feel like, again, like a recurring theme here is that I don't think we did a great job aging it. I feel like it kind of got a little more syrupy and like thicker and sweeter in ways that it wasn't originally intended to, but it still was pleasant. Um, oh, first I need to explain the wine scale. Um, the wine scale. I love this. Scale of zero. I need to like workshop this so I have like a... Something you I do. Just I mean, you say generally the same thing. I feel every like time. I make it up every time, and I don't. I hate it's it. um, it's generally the same. Yeah. So, uh, scale is zero to ten, um, but it's heavily weighted in the fact that a anything less than a five does not mean it's a bad wine. All the wines we drink are very good. So, ten is absolutely incredible out of this world. A zero could still be a good wine. Um, mm-hmm. So, this being a five point five means it is still a pretty good wine. Uh, I I liked it better than some of the other wines that we have had. Mm-hmm. I think I would have liked it better if it was fresher. Yes, or but I enjoy age. I enjoyed the whole thing. My mm-hmm. notes about it were that um, it still had that spice, almost more mm-hmm. in the aftertaste, really than anything else. It was very smooth on the initial mm-hmm. taste and almost like velvety, and um, I got a little bit of vanilla in it as well. And I I, I mean I really vanilla. enjoyed it all until the last like sip where i was like oh that's kind of sedimenty yeah i didn't get the vanilla i did um notice that it, it still had that like raisin level of sweetness mm-hmm. um and it's your favorite descriptor yeah it's been fairly common it's amongst a lot of these that we've been having and i i could be talked into like a 5.7 all right so it it was i'm know, not trying to talk yeah. you up do you boo yeah just it was pretty good i've, well, I've forgotten about all the the spice in the first mm-hmm. taste um I was trying to think more like as we were drinking it later on and, and, and letting it, ch- it get a chance to air out if the flavor changed. And I didn't really get much of a change there. So moving on, on to movie rating out of 10. Um, so the movie rating, we still also need to workshop kind of a, a rubric for this, but it's very. That's what we'll work on in our interim week of yeah. not watching a movie. Um, it's very subjective and we rate on a bunch of different categories or keep a bunch of different things in mind of like quotability rewatchability um cultural significance overall how much we liked it um various aspects of it but it's still all kind of a a lot of times just a a gut reaction but i feel like that's that's a great score is Mm -hmm. what what do i feel immediately after watching this yeah um i'll go first this week since i went uh you went first last week i'm gonna give it a 7.4 i was gonna give it a 7.3 yeah, I I, was I love when we're like right in the same. I was just gonna part. go with a flat seven, but I think the soundtrack is what really pulls it up mm-hmm. for me, and the fact that I like I used to listen to that soundtrack like uh, back of in like. You did. Well, it was a fantastic soundtrack, like just blasting it on my iPod Shuffle, back in the days. Yeah, I just it was it's it was just a really great like you know motivating like get stuff done like maybe i'm gonna go for a run maybe i'm just gonna like do my homework really well <laughs> just just oh a God, great geez, soundtrack stop, for, like, you're killing me. being productive okay um my reasoning for 7.3 is i i feel like i was a little stressed going into this week after a forest gump because i feel like that's going to kind of become the gold standard of what we're looking that's for i'm gonna give it a 10 like for it to be so Gold, but it, but, standard, yeah. but it really was mm-hmm. encapsulating what we are looking for in these yeah. movies that we're watching. Like I really just, I feel like that just covered all the bases that I was kind of nervous going into this week of like, this is not nearly going to be as good. Mm-hmm. But within the first five minutes last night, when we started watching it. I was like, all right, this mm-hmm. is a great movie. Like it's yeah. very well done. The acting is really well done. The, like you said, the soundtrack was great. Um, I mean, in 2023, I can tell when it was special effects, but they were still done really well mm-hmm. for like the most part. Or, like, or how well did it age? That like, of it. they're just like so much of it. I was like, I mean, the story was good. Mm-hmm. I thought it was great. It's definitely always going to have a nostalgia factor based on the fact that it's based on the ride, which I still remember from being, you know, like seven years old going to Disney World and just loving Pirates of the Caribbean. And 
it's it's a ride that like sticks with you. I could smell that that smell I, the whole time we were I watching it. Love that smell. I don't. <laughs> I can't explain it. I it's like the chlorine smell. Mm-hmm. ride smell. Yes. That I mean, it, I don't think I realized it last night, but tonight I was like, for the ride, and you start smelling that. And I was like, like, I can, I can smell the smell. Yeah. It's almost like a chlorine, but also it's, it, I feel like maybe it mixes in, in with like the like the cannon like gun smoke th- thing to it. Mm-hmm. It's just it's a very yeah a nostalgic uh, smell. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. Like when we went back, um, you know, when we first started dating, went to Disney World, and we got in line for for Pirates of the Caribbean. I hadn't been, been there in like what fifteen plus years, and immediately that, that smell brought me back. Yeah, mm-hmm. love it. So great. But, so a great movie. Yeah, just all well, all over. Well done. Mm-hmm. So, but um, I guess next up is our movie description. Mm-hmm. So, I so much goes on. Um, so, Jack Sparrow is a pirate who is trying to regain control of his ship that he was previously the captain of. Um, there has been a curse laid upon his previous crew who mutinied and, and abandoned him. And they are trying to get back, or they're trying to um, undo the curse by re- getting all of the gold they stole from the whatever uh, Cortez's treasure trove, and return that. And uh, Jack and supporting characters, um, I don't know, try to assist, but also get in the way of various things. And there's just so much that goes on. I don't know if I can give a, a very, very great uh, synopsis of it. Besides that, they go on a classic pirate adventure. Yeah, it's it's definitely a v- very much like a a family friendly PG thirteen rated um, family pirate adventure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a long movie. I'd forgotten just how long it was until yeah. now. There's so much that goes on, and it, it's very hard to give like an elevator speech and and cover everything um, yeah. that goes into Jack it. Sparrow goes on a quest to get his boat back. <laughs> <laughs> man, man loses ship. Yeah, An- antics ensue. <laughs> there it is. Nailed it. Yeah. All right. According to our TV up here, it says Jack Sparrow, a freewheeling 18th century pirate, quarrels with a rival pirate bent on pillaging Port Royal. When the governor's daughter is kidnapped, Sparrow decides to help the girl's love save her. I don't like this one. Yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> Also, who uses quarrels in like a serious like connotation? Yeah, there's like a lot of words there that I was not really prepared for. Freewheeling quarrels mm-hmm. and just pillaging. I mean, the they girls all fit. love save her. It's like they were just like really trying to fit a bunch of words into a character limit or something. Like, yeah. is that is that a hundred and forty? I liked how con- I liked how concise it was. Just mm-hmm. having had to read a bunch of these, but it was not. Yeah, it's like well done. To play golf with like the character count though, it just didn't. Yeah. didn't fit right. No. Um, but yours anyways. was yours was better, even though we had you had a hard time with it. Yours yeah, was better. Than I got this. lost halfway through mine. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? You're right. You're right. Uh, yeah. So um, if you're not familiar with the story, that's the gist of it. Guy loses his boat. There's a curse. Tries to get it back. Mm-hmm. Um, was the movie what you expected? Yes. I mean, yeah. we watched it back in 2020 mm-hmm. in, our, in the midst of our Jack Sparrow excitement. And I've seen it many times, especially when it first came out. Um, oh. And I'm trying to think back, though, thinking back to when you first saw it in theaters, it having, you know, been, been a ride, um, and which also, funny thing, thinking back now, when I went when I was seven, it was actually closed, and I was heartbroken. It wasn't until I went back when I was nine that I wrote it for the f- first time. And when we went together for the first time, it was closed. Mm-hmm. And we went back the next year and it was yeah. open. I so like, I feel like it closed So down curse of Andrew Berlin. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they were trying to like redo it for Pirates or some type and uh, just put Johnny Depp in the middle of the, the ride or something. Um, but trying to think back, like when I'd first seen this movie, um, was it what I expected? And I think, I, like, I'm trying to think like what, I guess 12 year old me would have really expected out of, out of this. And I, I don't know what I would have pictured. So I can say I did not see it in theaters. I did mm-hmm. not see it when it came out. I was too scared to see it. Makes sense. So I was much older when I saw it. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what I thought when I first saw it, but mm-hmm. like watching it now, I'm like, it is what I think of when I think of a true pirate story. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe not like losing his ship, but like he's trying to get something back and there's sword fighting and there's um, cannon fighting and mm-hmm. there's girl and 
gold and treasure and just that like back and forth that I feel like it's just a very true pirate story and it's well done. I think that for the fact that they had some really like obvious nods to the ride, especially in the beginning of like, you know, hanging out the keys to the, to the dog mm-hmm, and whatnot. The and, and then later with like the, the cannon um, fire uh, riding towards the ship. I, I feel like it's about as close to like what you could have expected having seen the ride and then say, what would they just make this into a movie mm-hmm. for? It didn't seem like it was completely out of, out of left field. Um, and, that and, they, and the women on Tortuga. Mm-hmm. They really like did a really good job of giving just enough of a nod to the original ride. Did not make it seem like mm-hmm. they were really like really laying it on thick. Mm-hmm. For taking the like what two minute long ride in mm-hmm. Walt Disney World mm-hmm. and making it into a two hour and however yeah. 20 some minute mm-hmm. long movie. Well done. Yeah. I don't know how many other rides at an amusement park have been made into a movie, but I think this definitely set mm-hmm. the standard to favor. Basically. Let's turn the Hall of Presidents into a movie. <laughs> I was thinking Apollo's Chariot, but... Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, how well did it age? I think we kind of touched on this a little bit with the CGI. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can tell, but it's not, it's not like... I've seen worse. Mm-hmm. I think it was amazing for its time. Mm-hmm. It was very well done for its time, and it still holds up for the most part. I think we are also accustomed to yeah. looking for it. 20 years later, it doesn't feel like it was 20 years of no. old of CGI. Obviously, Disney and their Imagineers are going to be, you know, mm-hmm. setting the standard for everything else. But um, I thought it aged very well, mm-hmm. and there weren't too many CGI um, obvious parts. Obviously, that the most obvious part is the ghost crew skeleton thing, yeah. and with that, you really had to kind of look to see where it was seemed like it was aged CGI. But I've seen much worse. Mm-hmm. Um, did they say the title of the movie in the well, movie? Could it be made today? Oh, yes, sorry, could it be made today. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any. Yeah, it's it's not was. like like Home Alone where like they would have a mm-hmm. cell phone or like some other kind of like technology where they could check in on him. Yeah, and culturally, I don't think like pirates are mm-hmm. something that I think can't this ex- exact again. script maybe the CGI would be mildly better. Mm-hmm. It would yeah. be this more or less the same. I mean, they're still making sequels to it to this day. I'm mm-hmm. sure. Uh, did they, did say they say the title of the movie, movie in the movie? I don't think so. They mentioned a curse. They mentioned the Black Pearl. I don't even know if they said Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't know. They definitely words individually. Yes, because I was paying close attention to Caribbean Mm -hmm. because I was like, "Do you?" I mean, I know it's Pirates of the Caribbean, but like so Mm -hmm. many people say Caribbean, or like Mm -hmm. I say Caribbean in certain instances, but like this is always Pirates of the Caribbean that I was always. I feel like I hyper focused on that. I have like a memory of talking with my mom about this (laughs) specific instance when I was younger and I think I had heard Caribbean or something, and I I said like the Caribbean Ocean, and my mom being like, "It's not Caribbean, it's the Caribbean Ocean." But it is the Pirates of the Caribbean. Like, it's it's a very specific case of, for some reason, that's how you say this ride mm-hmm. or this movie. I don't know her rules. I don't know. I, I've not checked her sources. I mean, I'd be interested in, in deep diving the pronunciation. Love that. The etymology of Caribbean. Um, Into that for next week. Sure. Um, does the title fit the movie? 100%. Yes. Obviously, you're being, making after the ride. You have to name it that. The fact that they gave it a tagline of the Curse of the Black Pearl mm-hmm. really helped them have sequels. Yeah. For I was sure. going to say, were they really just like, we're going to do a lot of these movies. Mm-hmm. We're just going to go ahead and add the the Curse of the Black Pearl. Yeah. I, I don't know what, what else you possibly could have done to make mm-hmm. that better. Unless you just called it like Pirates of the Caribbean, Jack Sparrow or something, which wouldn't have made sense with all the sequels they had. So mm-hmm. um, very, very well titled. Were there any actors that went on to do bigger things? Uh, That's... Interesting. Yes. So um, I feel like Johnny Depp was obviously very established at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Orlando Bloom had already done at least two. Or they'd already uh, put out two of the Lord of the Rings movies by the time this one came out. And I think Return of the King either had, had just come out or would come out very soon after that. He was already a big name. Um, Kira Knightley, I think, was already a relatively large name. Was I think this was, this was this? still... No. This was still early in her mm-hmm. career because I did uh, I did look into that and that's part of my notes. So she, she did she was in Bend It Like Beckham, one of my personal favorites from the early two thousands, mm-hmm. um, and and a couple other things. But this this in Love actually she came was out in the same the year. Phantom Menace, uh, Star Wars, because she was the that, Natalie Portman's mm-hmm. like um, double. Um, yeah, that and, was one of the things. Uh, but like um, Atonement and all those other things, like this was kind of the early. Mm-hmm. I'll get into it in a second early days of Keira Knightley. Um, Jeffrey Rush, I think, was already a very well-established name. Uh, Jonathan Price, I don't know what he was in before. I, I 
most recently know him as, funny enough, the High Sparrow in Game of Thrones. And he was Prince Philip in The Crown. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because he is um, the High Sparrow in Game of Thrones, but he played counter to Jack Sparrow in mm. Hearts of Gabion. So I, I don't know how many people went on to do bigger things that were like this was their first big role. It seemed like a fairly ensemble cast. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. It's I, not like it was a lot of people's first roles, but I mean, I they feel like it was early in Kira Knightley. Still early ish in Orlando yeah. Blooms, but like it's hard to, and it, I feel like it feel, doesn't feel right to call this an ensemble cast. I feel like that implies much more star studded names, but mm -hmm. it was a fairly um, reputable cast. Mm -hmm. So um, that answers that. And then, what impact do you think this movie had on pop culture? I mean, I think it was, it was based on pop culture in like the Disney mm -hmm. aspect, Ride. but then I, I feel like it also has made its own. I think also that the PG-13 aspect of this opened Disney up to more than just fairy tales. Mm -hmm. I think I, I'm very thing. interested to deep dive that PG-13 mm -hmm. rating. Yeah, I Disney, remember being very controversial. Drama. That, I think that was the bigger selling point here. Um, uh, it was fairly quotable um, with some of the lines of like, why is the room gone? Welcome to the Caribbean and... A couple of mm -hmm. the other... And I think just Jack Sparrow and how he... How Johnny Depp portrayed mm -hmm. that pirate was something that we saw a lot in yeah. other like um, reenacted in other things I mean, this is the first big movie that i knew johnny depp in because a lot of the movies that he had Me done too. before this were like r-rated or had been made a long time ago that he, he will always be jack sparrow to me because of that i know he's done yeah. so many other big things i mean that's definitely the first thing i think of when i think mm -hmm. of johnny depp is this yeah so I, I don't know where I would label this or put, put this on the whole like culturally significant scale of like a, a you know zero to a hundred type thing, but I think there are definitely aspects of it that um, you know were significant, and I think that the fact that they made so many sequels after this also played into the whole like um, Jack Sparrow becoming a, a big legend type thing. Mm -hmm. And do you feel cultured after watching it? Yes, L I mean. L Yes, because I, I mean, I know it does go on yeah. to have all the sequels and stuff as much as some of the other movies. No. Yeah. I would say not much, especially because we'd already seen it and we're very, we're very familiar with it mm -hmm. already that I didn't think this one was really like culturing me to have seen it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad to have watched it again in this era of watching movies mm -hmm. for us and like focusing on the different aspects of storytelling and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But it, like you said, I've seen it a couple of times before. Yeah. So. And if it were on, I might watch bits of it, but I don't know if I would fully commit to the full two hours of yeah, it. Yeah, mostly because it's so long. If it was like an like an hour and a half, hour and mm. forty five minutes, if sure. It's on I'd TV, commit. it's going to be like a four hour movie. Yeah, that's a long commitment. TV ruins everything. Mm -hmm. right, Michael Bolton would clearly. Yeah, he. I mean, he just to that and all the sequels. So. I mean, he's such a cinephile. He just got <laughs> out of watching a Pirates of the Caribbean marathon, so. Into your nose. <laughs> yeah. uh, do, do I go first or? You go first. Go first. Okay. Um, so I already mentioned the, the Jonathan Price high sparrow bit. Um, I just wanted to know where were they with all these giant rock formations? Because the, the, the Caribbean and like the East Coast, I don't really associate much with the rock formations, much more the West Coast. I did look up where they filmed it and they were filming it in Jamaica. And apparently that there are those natural rock formations we've, not been to Jamaica. Um, so maybe that is more appropriate, but it just, it almost felt like a situation of someone from the West coast filming this and saying, Oh, it's the ocean. There's big rock formations and all these big mountains. And that's, that's true. I hadn't thought about that. Not for the most part as common, but I guess it is more common in some of those um, small islands in the Caribbean. Uh, my next comment being bulk and skull. So there were the, the two red coats that were like the, the shorter, um, I know exactly what you're talking about right? as soon as you say The shorter fatter guy and the taller skinny guy was very much a bulk and skull from Love Power it. Rangers. But then also the pirates had their own shorter, fatter guy and taller, skinnier guy who was like the dumber one. So it all comes situation. back to Power Rangers. How many times have we referenced Power Rangers so far in this uh, podcast? A lot. We're clearly More. 90s kids. But <laughs> More than we should. So then that got me wondering, is, it, is there like a name for that, that like duo of, mm. of that is that because they go all back to like um you know uh 
Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, like back to Shakespeare days, or like where was the origin of this whole like we're gonna have two people that are not main cast but provide some sort of like that are physically different but provide like a different yeah. perspective on or we're like gonna, a they have that back and forth. Yeah, so I feel like it's a very common thing throughout a lot of movies that people like. I love my, it. I, I call it the the bulk and skull from Power Rangers, but is there a a name for this? Relationship. Wow, you got me on this one. I yeah. love that. I was because I mean, I don't think I actually wrote it down, but I wanted to say like I really loved the like red coats, mm-hmm. bulk and skull. Their dynamic I thought was mm-hmm. hilarious, and just especially how like Jack Sparrow like confuses them or like mm-hmm. it gives the um, trickery where he like gets them talking and then mm-hmm. he slips away and steals the, the boat. Sleight of just, hand. Sleight of hand. I think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Just like I loved their like how they like started feeding into each other. And that is, mm-hmm. I feel like such a common like character in a movie or characters, I guess yeah. that I don't know. I, I don't know if trope is the right word. It sounds like the right word, but I'm still not entirely sure what that yeah. word means. We have, we've got to figure this yeah. out because I love that. And I, and it wasn't until like the very end tonight where I was like, Oh, those pirates are very similar to the, the like British mm-hmm. Royal Navy people that like, maybe there's some like similarity here. I yeah. liked that. It's definitely something to unpack there. And, and I want to look more into that. Uh, my next note was that I thought suits in a club sounded bad, thinking back to Scarface, but the fact that these guys were up in like their their powdered wigs and their full on like whatever suits and probably like wooden shoes and these t- tall socks and they are in the Caribbean in likely like the summertime mm-hmm. or something. It's probably always hot. That, that sounds miserable. Hey, I'm going to stand outside in this awful humidity with these awful outfits. Just, I feel like once you've left like the British mainland, you should be allowed to be like, we're going to wear shorts mm-hmm. and we're going to invent flip-flops first order of business <laughs> yeah i mean i definitely was caught up in the wigs and how miserable that would be and then on top of that not only was kira knightley wearing especially when they like take her dress off when she mm-hmm. walks the plank and she's wearing the long sleeve dress but she had on top of that yet another dress that she was supposed to be wearing and just then the, mm-hmm. the corset which I think probably helped a lot of people in the past not have scoliosis. And I'm like, mm, maybe I should have worn one of those in my lifetime. But mm-hmm. just like all the layers for everybody. I mean, yeah. everybody was and like you know completely like covered. fabrics or no. you know, the, the light, like cool wool they, they make these days for suits. You know that all that stuff was just and miserable. The Caribbean has to be miserable in mm-hmm. any kind of hot time that to wear Bones all that. No, thank you. Yeah. Um, next up was that I missed the... Uh, the eunuch reference or line when, when I was younger, I didn't really understand like what that was, but they mentioned eunuchs a couple times in the movie. I assume you know what a eunuch is. It's like a guy like uh, balls chopped off. Yeah. Um, so they call him, uh, I call Will a eunuch, I think like once or twice in it. And it's very aggressive and not something that I, I would expect in a Disney movie. Um, That's totally why they over my head in the, in pushed the, the uh, PG-13, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not really sure why they, the, whoever was writing the script felt the reference to push that twice, but maybe that was a common thing with pirates to, to punish someone. Uh, my next thought was how long has this curse been going on that Jack wouldn't have run into them, but was familiar with the fact that there was a legend of a curse. Like, I, I want to know what the timeline on of it was when he, the, the muni happened and he was a aban- on that Island to when the events of our story take place was this years and whatnot, because it seemed like based on what Barbosa said, when they're in the moonlight, it shows them who for who they really are. And so I took that to mean this has been going on for like decades or a long time. And they've like, their bodies would have died and they're showing them like the skeletons that they would have become had they not been able to like have food or all these crazy things. But the fact that Jack later steals a token and immediately becomes that skeleton, it's more like is the curse that when you take one of these, you become just a, a skull. Yeah. I, that was lost on me too. When all of a sudden he was like stabbed, but, not dead. And mm-hmm. I, there like, was some I mean, missing piece there like for me. The, the, the pirate, you know, the skull and crossbones type thing of like, you just become a, a skeleton, I guess is the meaning there. Mm-hmm. But um, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. I would like to know like if there's, if anyone's done any research on like how long between some of these events that they were mentioned mm-hmm. there would have, would have actually taken A little bit place. more of a timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked the Snow White reference when he's uh, offering or purpose is offering, um, Elizabeth the various foods like the chicken the bread and then offers her the apple and she's like no the apple is poisoned after he's already like drink wine had all these other foods because I feel like the apple being poisoned is very much a snow white like oh yeah 
the, I find it funny. It's the first thing that she questioned, but also I think it's a direct yeah. nod to being like, hey, we're a Disney film. <laughs> Disney's most iconic like movie that really set us off was Snow White. I love that. I mean, I don't know that I tied it directly to Snow White, but as soon as it was the apple, I was like, that's obviously poison because you just grow up watching Snow White and like mm-hmm. apples are just Everything the first thing, apples, the first thing that people want to poison. Uh, I feel like this was one of the first movies that I really noticed that a lot of the lines felt like they were almost trying too hard to be included in the preview. Like the fact when he goes like, you must start believing in ghost stories, Miss Juan, you're in one. Like, I feel like that was one that I very much remember from being in all the previews, all the commercials of like trying to advertise this movie. Likewise, the welcome to the Caribbean lad, like that Johnny Depp line, I also feel like was included in every single trailer. Mm-hmm. Which makes you want to go like watch the, the trailers for this to see if that is, is true. But we'll obviously do that. In I the feel intro. like a lot of movies now try to include something like that so they can market the movie. And I don't know how much that's pushed for like the from the director or from the studio just to tell the the writers or the screenwriters to say, hey, include this so that we can market this. Give us a tagline mm-hmm. that we can really heavily push. That I don't know if that would have been true in some of the older movies that people would have thought that much about it. But I feel like nowadays, the more and more I watch a movie, I see something and I'm like, oh, that's clearly going to be in the in the trailer or that clearly would have been in the preview. Yeah, he's Mr. Like, I want to know literally zero about mm-hmm. a movie. I don't want to see a trailer. I don't want to know anything because it's going to give it all away. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, it's like they have to give every single plot point away in, in, the, in every trailer. And I feel like trailers have gotten longer too where they're just like including more mm-hmm. and more. And they wouldn't do it if it didn't sell tickets. But like, I personally hate it, so... Um, mm-hmm. where's that whole targeted advertising that Google has been promising me? I don't want to see these kind of ads. I want to see a title and that's it. Just tell <laughs> me this movie will, will be good. Tell me nothing about it. <laughs> and everyone else that wants to see all the spoilers, give them those, those ads. Um, talked about the, the CGI. So imagine the, the dread of being on a ship, like, and you're in the, the Caribbean or you're somewhere on the sea and you know, a pirate ship is chasing you down. And just knowing that dread of like that, that ship is slowly gaining on you and you're not going to make it where you need to be. And it's going to take like, maybe two, three hours for them to catch up to you based on the Mm -hmm. wind or something like that. But knowing like, hey, this awful, terrible pirate crew that's going to come destroy my ship, kill people or worse, like whatnot. Imagine just knowing that's happening. There's nothing you can really do to stop it. And you're in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. Terrifying. Nope. I am not cut out for that. Slow, long, like terrifying dread. Nope. And I think they did kind of a good job of like playing that up of like knowing, that, hey, the Black Pearl's like coming up, like coming up. It's slowly catching up. And every time they keep looking, it's getting closer and closer. And they're doing everything they can to go faster. But like that dread, I feel like they did a good job at least of introducing that. But it could be terrifying. Oh, yeah. In real life. Um, I thought it was interesting that the uh, the boat that they, they, I guess the interceptor that they're on, when they ha- have ditched everything they, they can to make the boat lighter to try to get away from the Black Pearl, they realize they're going to have to go into combat. So they load up the cannons with silverware to shoot, which, interesting plot point, because it gets the whole, like, knife in the wooden eye, for the most part. Fork. Like, fork, yeah. But how much silverware do they have on that boat that's meant mm-hmm. for, like, eight And was people? silverware not the first thing you throw at? Yeah. Seems like be heavy like, and I would rather toss. keep the like cannonballs and the ammunition mm-hmm. and all that stuff and get rid of the silverware yeah. and eat with my hands before like getting rid of all of the yeah, firearms. A lot of forks and knives and uh, I don't know. It seemed like a lot more silverware than we meant for a crew that, yeah. that small. But um, then on the island, um, when they've had all the rum and... Elizabeth convinces Jack to drink all of the rum and passes out and he wakes up and that guy has never been shown drinking water the entire movie. I'm sure in the Caribbean, you've been sweating a lot. You're very dehydrated for the most part. You've woke up, you wake up on this Island. You've been breathing in the smoke from everything burning around you. And he wakes up and he's just not hung over as hell. I'm sure that rum was not very pure and definitely would not give like the easy hangovers. Unless he was just still drunk. Maybe. That's the only real explanation explanation I can think of because that, otherwise that's all I got for you. Unless unless Disney was afraid to like portray a hangover, and that might bump them up to the R rating. Because <laughs> I can tell you, if I'd had that much rum and I'd passed out and in that situation, I would be just vomiting for days. Yeah, that was my thought because at one point she holds up a bottle. I guess I mean he took the two bottles out of there, mm-hmm. and I'm like, she drank a lot of that. Well, she was like pouring out when he wasn't looking. Yeah. I mean, she would be throwing up everywhere. Mm-hmm. There is no way she would be totally chill. Mm-hmm. Both of them would just be 
absolutely terribly yeah. hungover. I could almost feel my head liquor, hurting. Uh, rum. Just thinking about the hangover mm-hmm. from that much rum. I, my body also wouldn't let me get wouldn't let me drink that much. I would definitely throw up before yeah. I got that close. I I've never really been like a rum guy, like anyways. Oh me either. However, like the first time that I really like drank and got drunk um, was when my brother bought me a bottle of Bacardi One Fifty One rum which is like the worst rum for like drinking but unless you're the objective is just to get you drunk or to light stuff on fire um but it's really funny because i had this this bottle of party 151 um drank it and i still had it like with me and my girlfriend at the time found the bottle of rum got mad that i had any alcohol in high school and poured it all out which was very annoying because like it's not super easy to procure more alcohol when you're in high school regardless of whether you should be drinking or not um but i remember like explaining to my friends like hey you know girlfriend found the, the rum poured it all out like we don't have any more i don't have any more alcohol like for us to, to drink whatnot and i remember my best friend like turning to me and just <laughs> point blank just saying but why is the rum gone <laughs> clearly quoting the movie but it was just so absolutely well played that i will always think about that whenever i see that the scene mm-hmm. where um where Johnny Depp goes, but why is the rum gone after like Elizabeth explains this whole thing of like what they were doing and all that? Like, but why is the rum gone? It's gone. Um, uh, I thought the pirates were a lot less ruthless to Jack and his crew than, than they were to the the redcoats when they were boarding the the British ships. It seemed like with Jack's crew, they were just kind of like, hey, we're not going to kill really anyone. We're going to let you guys all be like imprisoned, but anyone that's from the British like Navy, whatever, we're going to kill them all. Yeah, I was very alarmed when they just like walked up to that one red coat and just slit mm-hmm. his throat. And I was like, oh, yeah. we haven't done that. Yet. Like, I, it, I was surprising to me how alarmed I felt by it because mm-hmm. I think because they hadn't done anything that aggressive yet. Like, I'm but, sure there's like some sort of code between pirates, but not that different. I feel mm-hmm. like you would still be trying to neutralize whoever your adversaries are. Yeah. This, but so the soundtrack, I mentioned already that that was absolutely amazing. Um, I was briefly looking into it though during the movie. And Hans Zimmer actually was not originally the composer of it, that the executive producer, um, Jerry Bruckheimer, I guess was not happy with the way the soundtrack was going for the movie. And so he actually then hired Hans Zimmer to rescore the whole movie. That I would love to know how the original one sounded Mm -hmm. and how, like, did he go behind the director's back or, like, how that all really played out. I I very briefly, briefly looked into that. But I just remember this being a very iconic soundtrack in my mind and i i can always always tell when a hans zimmer score is in a movie because it's just a lot of it has a lot of really similar um vibes and traits yeah. like it's it feels very iconic um the same way that a john williams score feels very familiar mm-hmm. but it's very interesting that he was not the original and i almost want to go back after having found that out like three quarters of the way through the movie to rewatch the whole thing and see how it felt like it was retrofitted in some ways because in, in a little bit at the end it I was watching it being like, this was not, this original score was not intended for this. How did they cut this to match up with that? Also, was it just me or Jack Sparrow's song is based off of the soundtrack? There are parts of the score Mm -hmm. that sound like the, this is the tale. Mm -hmm. And I, and the the song. Yeah, the song. Yeah, 100% the song would be based off of this. um, The soundtrack. Yeah. I, uh, Mm-hmm. I've only seen this movie yeah. maybe like two to three times. Like I'm not super familiar with it mm-hmm. that I was like, Oh, that's where the song comes from. And yeah. it, and it's not the, cause I was like, expecting it to keep going. And it is just a really like a couple of notes mm-hmm. that really inspired that part of the song. And I feel like that's almost part of like the cultural, cultural significance of the movie is that the soundtrack really like, I don't know if it's that, that, that uh, chord progression or how they portray it, but it definitely gives like a, like, you know, out on the seven seas buccaneer like a vibe to mm-hmm. it that does carry on to like the, the jack sparrow lonely island song that i don't know how to describe that or what what the right way of describing but it is, also but. to how did we not talk about cultural significance yeah it inspired <laughs> back, the whole reason why we're back at this. the beginning the whole reason we're watching this is that this movie created i don't even know how much later it was mm-hmm. lonely island from uh, SNL. It must have been after at least a couple sequels came out because he he was watching the Pirates of the Caribbean marathon in it. So I would assume this. I think it was like the trilogy he was Mm -hmm. watching that like that inspired this whole song on SNL Mm -hmm. (laughs) that we've been singing for three years straight. Michael Bolton became a cinephile and just was obsessed with (laughs) Pirates of the Caribbean. Such a great song. Please go listen to it. (laughs) 
And then my last bits was that I thought there were a lot of random unnecessary acrobatics at the very end with uh, um, Will, Will f- trying to free Jack at the end. Um, just a bunch of like random somersaults in the air and flips that just seemed out of place. Yeah, and the whole like freeing Jack sequence was mm-hmm. was weird. It, it was like kind of like, shot. we're just trying to wrap this up. Let's just... It almost felt like a different crew or it was filmed mm-hmm. like before everything else uh, type type of thing. Um, but it also made me think of in Love Actually, there's like a, a separate cut where the little boy is running through the airport. There's like a whole, like a r- random like ap- acrobatic cut where he does a whole bunch of like cartwheels and flips and over the top things that they ended up recutting because they were like, this is kind of weird. That it almost feels like a situation where someone just got really carried away with this and it just didn't get cut for some reason. Or maybe they, they planned a, diff- a lot more acrobatics in the beginning and they mm-hmm. cut those but left this in. Yeah, I agree. Know. That was weird. Um, but yeah, so my last notes being that the fir- I wanted to give shout outs to the first assist- assistant directors. So we cover that in our behind the screens. Uh, Peter Kohn, Kahn, K-O-H-N. Kahn. And uh, the best boys. So best boy electric, uh, Jarek Gorzyski. Gorzyski. Sure. Uh, Rigging best boy, Javier Ferrer. Best boy grip, Ray D. Chase. And best boy rigging grip, Glenn Purdy. Could not have made this movie without them, for sure. He's so dedicated to watching the credits. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. They're the best boys that ran it, so why would I not shout them out? All right, All right. moving on to my notes. Um, so my first note was, was this the beginning of the Kira Knightley craze? And I should have kept her Wikipedia page pulled mm-hmm. up because I know her from Bend It Like Beckham before this and like you said, Star Wars. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it was like this and Love Actually were the same year and then Pride and Prejudice, Atonement and all that. Like this mm-hmm. was just kind of the beginning of everyone. Be, like I just remember in middle and high school, everyone being like, oh, Kieran Knightley, she's so hot. Like mm-hmm. she's so beautiful. Like, Yeah, definitely. I think this was the the main thing. because like This was of, one of those like first things that really triggered. I don't know how many would have watched Love Actually at the time. I think, I think it's become more and more of a cult classic mm-hmm. uh, later. Uh, at least in the, in the U.S., but I feel like this was the, really the what put Kieran Ailey on the map as For like sure. a you know a boy lust icon. Mm-hmm. Her and her corset really set them off. Yeah, her long sleeve gown. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, kind of on that same note, because we've been singing the Jack Sparrow song for three years. You know, I forgot about the entire rest of the cast that was in this movie, mm-hmm. and as soon as. You were like, oh, Orlando Bloom. And I was like, oh, that's right. He's in this movie. Mm-hmm. And oh, Karen Ellie. Oh, yeah, she's in this movie too. Nope. I was just so sucked into that song that I forgot about everything but else that about Orlando Bloom in this like trilogy, I don't know how many of the sequels he was in, um, but at least in, in this one that probably, I'm sure made the most money in, in a couple of the sequels. And then also being the Lord of the Rings and then like The Hobbit. He hasn't done much after that that I know of. Maybe he just kind of flopped after that. But the amount of residual money he can make from just being the fact that he was in Pirates of the Caribbean and in Lord of the Rings, like Forrest Gump would say, he doesn't have to worry about money anymore. Mm-hmm. For sure. Just those two franchises. He's got to be just being like, yeah, I'm going to do whatever I want from now on. Yeah, he picked his uh, casting calls mm-hmm. right. I would love to see him. On, I would love to see him on Hot Ones. Ooh. If he's not already. I know. I was going to say, maybe we need to see if he's been on there yet. Um. I feel like from scene one, Johnny Depp's acting was just amazing. He is Jack Sparrow. He, mm-hmm. like, that character is him. It is so well done and kind of similar to what we've talked about with Harrison Ford and in Indiana Jones and uh, Tom Hanks and um, Forrest Gump. Like, even j- just down to his eye movement mm-hmm. and his body language. I mean, so props to him. From what I've heard is that when they wrote the role of Jack Sparrow, he was meant to... He wasn't meant to be that like aloof, you know, weird Johnny Depp. Like he was meant to be more like a, a really smart, you know, sharp guy. And he, in this movie, at least he is very much like portrayed as that with obviously some Johnny Depp um, spin on it. In the sequels, I think they made him into more and more of a caricature. But apparently Johnny Depp, like on the very first day of shooting, was just like put on this weird like, you know, vibe of like a coked out. <laughs> or yeah, know, some I, I don't of, even like, know how to describe it. Out pirate. And they just but it's it Jack and Sparrow. Like, this is what he's going to be. Mm-hmm. That yeah, I, I I don't know how he how he did that or what what caused him to do that, but it just worked so well. Mm-hmm. I mean, so well done. And then when Johnny Depp and Orlando Bloom are sword fighting in the blacksmith mm-hmm. place, I feel like that is every little boy's like 
I'm going to be in a sore fight one day. Mm -hmm. Like it was that sequence of Mm -hmm. all of that back and forth. I've been training every day for this. Yep. Three hours a day. But it also made me so tired. Like watching them just being like, how much your arm would hurt after Mm -hmm. like 30 seconds of that, let alone adrenaline. however long they went for it. The next day, sure. In the moment, adrenaline. True. So like I mentioned last night, my cousins all went to see this at the beach because this says it came out on July 8th, 2003. We went mm. usually in July. So I'm certain it had just come out. And they're like, oh, we're all going to go. And I was like, I don't think I want to go see this movie. Too and spooky. Kira Knightley with all those um, skeletons on the ship mm-hmm. when she's like first taken aboard the Black Pearl and she goes out after the like poison apple scene. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's, that's the scene why I didn't want to see this movie. <laughs> like it's still, obviously I'm an adult and I'm like mm-hmm. okay with it now, but I'm like, that is exactly why, how old was you I? Then start believing in ghost stories. 12 year old me was like, mm-mm. Mm-hmm. nope I'm not gonna see this absolutely not <laughs> and then after that there were like several scenes where I was like yeah this is why I did not have any interest mm-hmm. in seeing this when it came out and I remember like going back to school in the vault and everyone would be like Pirates of the Caribbean and I was like nope <laughs> too spooky for me not for me I'm so sorry um so good on her for acting through that because I was not about it in 2003 mm-hmm. and then uh, also why is there always a storm in pirate stories mm-hmm. even like even tonight, I read our three-year-old child. <laughs> on a pirate ship. The, the, whatever the book is called, like mm-hmm. the pirates, the like short board book pirate mm-hmm. story that she had because she wanted to read it. And there was a, a thunderstorm on that, in that three-year-old well, board book it. too. And then how, there's storms in here. And every pirate story I've ever heard is always a storm. Well, they're all like Caribbean pirates and most of the stories we would have heard. And think about in Florida, every day at like 430 it's gonna rain. Give me a thunderstorm. Mm-hmm. That I imagine in the in the Caribbean, it's very much that same way. I feel like every day you're gonna get one to two thunderstorms. It, it takes part of the job. And that was my thought too after I wrote it down. But I was yeah. also like, of course, there's a storm. Mm-hmm. There's always like a storm that like mm-hmm. affects the ship and everybody's in the rain and yeah, I don't know. That was miserable. But oh, yeah, and that's and that's why I had to make note of it because I'm like, nope, mm-hmm. I'd be down below being like, y'all handle this. This is uh, not for me. You'd be probably throwing up off, uh, the, side yeah. of the, off the side of the boat. Are just into a bucket underneath, yeah. avoiding all of that. Um, and then my last note, because I really didn't have too many notes, I thought it was a great movie. I just was taking it all in. Mm-hmm. But the pirate code. All these ragtag people mm-hmm. are going to just be like, oh, you said parlay, I won't harm you, come with me. Like, that, they seem to follow no rules, but then they follow pirate code really strictly. It just, it doesn't seem to fit their... So what I kind of took it as Who is they, they kind of mentioned that where the, the pirate code basically only applies to pirates. And I imagine that kind of means like, yeah, we're going to totally take from the, you know, the government or whoever else we're going to steal all that. But if you're another pirate, we're at least going to give you the opportunity to like parlay and like talk with our captain before we just go ahead and off you. And I kind of take it similar to the way like in, in the wire where they talk about someone like being in the game versus not in the game. There's yeah. kind of like a code amongst like the the Baltimore drug dealers and the wire wire of like how they handle things versus with them versus everyone else. And I think it's kind of a similar thing they're talking about here. It's like if you are another pirate, you know, maybe we want you to join our crew. Maybe we want to, you know, work something out or maybe, you know, where something else is and you can we can negotiate these things. So we're going to give an opportunity for you to talk with the captain in a place where, you know, if we disagree, we'll just go ahead and off you. But like an opportunity before we just go before our, our grunts kill another pirate crew a chance to see if there's something more valuable there is more what I took it as. I think they kind of ran with it of whole, the whole, like there's a bunch of like, there's a code, there's guidelines and there's, you know, things mm-hmm. to uh, a, a series of procedures and, um, and I just, I feel like see plans that goes back to reading me on the pirate ship book. I read tonight mm-hmm. where they take this pirate ship and then they just invite the crew onto their boat. They <laughs> hey, literally oh gosh, oh, come on back. We, t- we have all this gold, but like, why don't you come join us? Was literally how the book <laughs> Yeah, that, then maybe that's party. that's where that all comes from mm-hmm. but it just doesn't seem to fit their personalities of like we're gonna just like destroy literally everything but if you if you know the code mm-hmm. then we will obviously calm down and not attack you yeah. i don't know just maybe was weird some to mutual me. respect to being like hey you're just mm-hmm. going and, stay and that all makes sense too, too so go on your way and we'll we'll leave you be yeah but that's it for me i yeah. i did very much enjoy it a lot more than i was expecting to mm-hmm. And, um, I think in my mind, like it's, it's very much like the prototypical, just like a good action adventure family movie. Mm -hmm. And I could see where I wouldn't want to watch it. Obviously we have very small children right now, but I think Mm -hmm. like 
at a certain point, we're going to get to it. And I was like, yeah, this would be like a really fun like movie to watch as a family. And it's adventure and it's action. And mm -hmm. there's some stuff that the kids will find funny. But then there's stuff that we'll find funny that they won't find funny. There's it's like a lot of layers to it. Head until they're like 30. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it was great. Well, well done, Disney, for taking your water ride mm -hmm. and turning it into a two hour and 20 minute long movie. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't like take a whole bunch of other rides and make them into movies. So I guess they mm -hmm. like Tower of Terror. They made into like a a short. It was a movie. It was a Twilight Disney Zone. Channel original no, or a Disney, Disney Channel film. original movie. Yeah, um, but I feel like they could have very much run with all the other ones and run that run into the ground. So mm -hmm. no, they didn't. But they did a good, great job with this one. Can't say as much about the sequels. I think I only watched like one, maybe two of the sequels. And then I think they just went way downhill and they were just clearly grasping for money. Yeah, I've maybe seen one. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But cool. that is it for episode 15 and season one. Mm -hmm. Also, cheers to us for uh, finishing Whole out season. our first season. And again, if you're enjoying this podcast and you've been listening along with us for the last 15 episodes, if you could rate and review the podcast, like and subscribe on YouTube, we appreciate all the feedback, all the comments. If there's any movies or any genres that you think we should explore in the coming seasons, mm -hmm. um, email us at culturenightpod at gmail.com or leave a comment on any of our social medias. Um, follow us on Instagram at culturenightpod and Twitter at culturenightpod. And tune in next week so you can hear the origin story of where we even got the idea for this podcast mm -hmm. and uh, hear all of our reflections and thoughts on season one. And our deep dives into like Bulk and Skull and whatnot. Yes, we will We will do a short slept on it segment for mm -hmm. Pirates of the Caribbean next week because we. I feel like there was a lot more came of deep dives yeah. than I was expecting from this episode. Mm -hmm. So we will look into all that stuff and then share some of our other fun behind the scenes stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's it for this week. Cheers. Cheers to episode 15.